Corinthians 16, verses will be 13 through 14. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. Let's have a prayer. Holy, righteous, heavenly Father God, and we are indeed thankful that you allowed us to assemble together this morning. Pray to Lord that you'll keep us safe while we worship you, that our minds may be able to clearly focus on worshiping you. Thank you for your blessings, dear Lord, of all our brothers and sisters. We pray for those in the prayer list that you might comfort us each and edify us. May we stir each other up for good works to glorify you, Father God. And dear Lord, we're so thankful that you loved us so much and continue to love us that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us and you rose from the dead. Father, please forgive us of our sins and may you always be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, song for the Lord's Supper is going to be number 354. 354. I'm going to sing all four verses of 354. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed. That thou my ransom be, and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? My Father's house of life, my glory is
the couple of scriptures out of First Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, And he, gave, and he took bread and gave and he gave gave thanks. He broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink as you drink it in remembrance, in remembrance of me. For as often as you, you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Dear <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this time we can assemble. We thank you for this bread as, as it represents the body of Christ as he died on the cross for the remission of our sins. May we examine ourselves and partake of it in a matter of pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we partake of this fruit of vine, this emblem which represents Christ's blood, may each of us be mindful of that great sacrifice that was made for us. We're sorry for causing that death. But Father, we are ever grateful for the sacrifice that Jesus made. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
conclude the Lord's Supper. The song for the offering is going to be number 742. 742. Sing the first verse only of 742. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord had done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has Read a verse or two concerning the collection. This is in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collection when I come. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're indeed thankful for your Son that came into this world and died on the cross for remission of our sins. Thankful for all the many blessings which He gives us as we go from day to day for our jobs that we may earn and prosper a living. May we give back a portion of our earnings with willingness of heart to further your service in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> Unite to sing, God is love. Let heaven and earth their praises bring, God is love. Let every soul from sin away, each in his heart sweet music. Thank you. 
Will you pray, please? Precious Heavenly Father, we come to you on this glorious Lord's Day to worship you in spirit through songs and through lessons brought to us. We thank you for America, Lord, where we may worship you unoppressed. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the elected officials always place you in America. In God we trust. Father, now at this time, we thank you for this beautiful day, the coming of fall where everything relaxes and goes through the winter and is able to wake up, wake up in the spring according to your will, the way you created it. Father, we have many who are sick and afflicted with the diseases of this world and would ask at this time that you lift them up and restore them to their much desired health. Your will be done. Father, we pray always for the widows and the orphans of this world who cannot take care of themselves. We pray for the little ones that are being born into this world with no one to love them. That you will supply such, Lord, and let those little ones know that they are loved. Heavenly Father, now we pray for Mary Alice as she ventures into a new journey in her life that you will lift her up and show her the way to adjust to this task in her life. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will forgive us of our many sins and transgressions, that you will watch over us as only you can, our Lord, our Savior. In your Son's precious name, we ask this prayer and be lifted up to you. Amen. Please be seated. All right. The song for the lesson is going to be number 528. 528. Do the first, second, and last verse of 528. I know where our Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life He gives from sin and sorrow free. I know. Yes. 
Number 909. 909. Brother Donald. Let me encourage you to take your Bible out and turn, if you will, over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And in just a moment, we're going to be in verse 6, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. And we're talking this morning, and you can reach into your bulletin, and there you'll find a sermon outline for the lesson this morning. That's not in the Bible. And we're going to look at some of these things that are common today. Uh, they're taught today, but you don't find any scriptural support for them in the Bible now, this is kind of a, a part two lesson for us. Um, a while ago, in fact, I think it was back toward the time when I first uh, came here, um, we talked about sayings that were not in the Bible. And we looked at different things that, that people say different ways in which they look at some of the scripture verses that are in there and they kind of change them a little bit or add something to them. And before you know it, it it's not anything that you can recognize by being something that's from the Word of God. And I give you there at the top of your outline where it says that's not in the Bible, I give you kind of a quick review of that lesson. And some of the things that we talked about where people believe that Eve ate from an apple, but that's not in the Bible. The, the fruit that was eaten from is never identified. Or we have that understanding that three wise men came to see the infant Jesus, but that's not in the Bible. It mentions that three gifts were brought, but the exact number of wise men, magi who brought those gifts, we don't know. There's a saying that is often uh, used by people, God helps those who help themselves. Well, believe it or not, that's not in the Bible. In fact, Benjamin Franklin said that in 1736. So it's been around for an awful long time. And then one of the other things that we talked about, and again, this is stretching your, your memory and going back to that first sermon. We talked about how some people say, love the sinner, hate the sin. And I, I, I like what's implied by that. I certainly do. But that's not in the Bible. In fact, that phrase was said specifically by Gandhi. And again, I, I, I know what they're going for, and I understand kind of the theological implications that they're trying to push down the road just a little bit, but it's not something that we can turn back to and say, well, thus says the Word of God, or this is where it's stated, or this is why we can trust it, because it's emphasized over here in Scripture, you see? It's brought out for us to know and digest and, and understand. There are all kinds of sayings. I gave you, what, four or five there? There's all kinds of sayings that people have that have no scriptural support. Now, does it matter? I, I think that's a good question. What if it's close? I mean, it's not exactly like it says in the Bible, but, but what if it's close? And then the question is, does it really matter what, what fruit it was that, that Adam and Eve ate from? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, isn't the, it the consequence that we're focused on and not what that fruit may be? So this is the argument that's put forth. And somebody says, what, what does it matter if we say there were three wise men? What, what, there's, what's, what's the big deal about it? Three gifts, three wise men, it kind of fits together for us. Why does it matter? Well, first of all, it does matter. And it matters for a couple of reasons. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning there, in, uh, uh, for, uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, Paul says these words. He says, Now these things, brethren, I have go back to 5 and 4 and 3. He says, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes. Why, Paul? Why have you figuratively transferred these things to you and Apollos? He says, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. That none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against another. That you may not think beyond what is written. That you may not go beyond the sacred page. That your understanding, your theology, the doctrines that you hold. Paul says that they'll have bookends. 
And those bookends aren't what, what man says or what this person over here says, but, but those bookends are the Word of God. And so Paul says, keep it between the lines. Keep it within Scripture. And, and Peter ad addresses this same idea. If you go over to 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 20, Peter begins to talk about staying between the lines, staying within Scripture, when he highlights the importance of Scripture. And he says these words, he says, knowing this first, so that, this, this is the most important thing. We would say today, listen to this, listen, listen to this, listen to this, hear, hear me on this. You, you need to know this, kind of what we would say, that what's being said is important. So he says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Peter says God inspired the Word. Peter says that when these prophets spoke, they weren't speaking what they thought. It wasn't of any type of private interpretation. The prophet wasn't saying, here's what I think you need to know, or this is what I think is the most important thing. Peter says, listen, the words that they spoke came by way of the Holy Spirit. God told them what to say. God revealed those words to him. Why? Because God wanted them to know, hold on, God wanted them to know what he wanted them to know. He didn't want us to know what man thought. He didn't want us to know man's philosophies and theories on different things. God said, here's the important thing. This is what you need to understand. So when you step back and you think about that, it, it does matter whether these things are in the Bible or not. It matters whether or not we can go back and we can say, thus saith the Lord. Here's our, our, our support from the Word of God, relying on the fact that this has been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Yes, it matters. Yes, it's important. Things that men say and doctrines that men teach, they affect us, church. They have an impact on us, whether good or or bad. Let me highlight, I want to give you five real quick this morning. Let me highlight, now we're going from sayings that, that we don't find in Scripture, what we looked at before. Now we're, now we're enlarging it to doctrines, to teachings that are not found in the Bible. Here's the first one, the teaching of once saved, always saved. That's not in the Bible. Now, you've heard me say this before. If there was one that I wish were in the Bible, I certainly wish it would be this one. If there was one that I would definitely preach from this pulpit, that we could say, listen, we have this security, that once we become a New Testament Christian, we don't have to worry about falling away. We don't have to worry about whether or not on that great day of judgment we're going to be found faithful or unfaithful. Once we're saved, we're always saved. It sounds great, and it even preaches great. But it's not in the Bible. Man teaches that a Christian cannot fall from grace. But the Bible teaches we are, we, that, that Christians can lose their salvation. In fact, this warning that when one becomes a New Testament Christian, that they can do things and live in such a way that they lose their salvation is taught in several different places. Let me give you a couple this morning. Go over to, to 1 Corinthians, look at chapter 9, and I want you to go down to verse 27. It's the, the uh, last verse in the chapter. And Paul says, he says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Those are two extremes. If one can be disqualified, then Paul is arguing by way of inference that one can be qualified. You can't be disqualified for something if you weren't originally qualified for it. So Paul is saying, listen, I have discipline in my life because I don't want to lose that which I have, that qualification that is mine in Christ. I don't want to become disqualified. Think about it. 
as a race or a sport. If you're disqualified, you're, you're out. If you're disqualified, you, you're, you don't stay in the game. You, you go to the sideline. Paul says, I don't want that for myself. I don't want to be that type of Christian. Go on over to Galatians chapter 5. And again, this is Paul talking, but his audience is a little bigger here. First, he was talking to the Corinthians. Now he's talking to a region of churches in Galatians chapter 5. And he says these words beginning there in verse, uh, Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again, again, with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit, profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become extra, extra, estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. If you are a Christian and you think you can go back to the law, you're throwing away. To use Paul again, you're becoming disqualified. If you step away from the grace that you find and through the blood of Jesus Christ and the mercy of God, and you say, I want to live by rules and regulations of a different dispensation, you become disqualified. You're counting yourself out. You're, you're um, uh, putting yourself on the sideline. And Paul doesn't want that for us. Over in, in the book of Hebrews, you're in... Galatians, turn forward in your, your Bible, over in Hebrews chapter 3, and go down to verse 12, and Paul says this, he says, beware brethren, or the author of Hebrews, I should rightly say, whomever that may be, he says, beware brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. In departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Through the deceitfulness of sin we can depart. We can leave. In, in, in just a, a, a moment you're going to depart this building. What, you're not staying here. You're, you're going to depart this, this building. You're, you're not going to be here anymore. You're leaving. And that's what Paul is talking about. You're departing. You're leaving. He says, I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want you to leave. Once saved, always saved sounds so great. But that's not in the Bible. Here, here's the second thing. The doctrine that says Christians are not to judge. Did you know that's not in the Bible? Now, let me say this before we get into it. Uh, let's not go to the extreme. And I think sometimes we're, if we're not cautious, we do that. Let's not go to the, the extreme and look at every single thing that a person does and say, condemnation, condemnation, condemnation. Let's not go to the extreme and expect people to live a life of perfection. People stumble. They struggle. People go through times of, of difficulty. We're not talking about being a people who go around and are super critical of every single thing that a person does and not allow their time for growth. Not allow the fact that we stumble. But the concept of, listen, it's wrong for you under any circumstance, and may, maybe that's the key. It's wrong for you under any circumstance to judge somebody. It's not in the Bible. Man teaches that since we're all sinners, and I don't know of anybody who would deny that, Romans 3 and in verse 23, I, I, I don't know of anybody who would say that man is a perfected being, never giving over to sin. If that were true, it nullifies the blood of Jesus Christ. Goodness, it, it nullifies the purpose of Christ's coming in the first place when he said in Luke 19 and verse 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. How are we lost through sin? 
So I don't know of anybody who's going to argue that, that first part, but they say this, because we're all sinners, we can't judge. You see, we're just as guilty. But the Bible teaches, we are told at times that a judgment call must, and, and let me underline and highlight and put in a parenthesis and italicize must. There are these times when it's not an option. And I, I know that's that, oh, but you just talked about uh, a little compassion and you just talked about ha having some, some mercy and that nobody's perfect. Whatever. But there are times when we have to pass a judgment call. Let me, let me give you some examples. Go over to the Gospel of Matthew. Go over to Matthew chapter 7. And I want you to go down to, to verse 15. It's beginning a new part of, of Matthew chapter 7. And, and Jesus is the one who's speaking. And he's going to talk about individuals. Okay? He's going to talk about individuals. And he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits, the, by, by their actions, by the way they live, by the things they do, their fruits. He says, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Of course they don't. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Verse 20 is a reference to verse 15. Verse 20 is a reference to the very people that Jesus was, uh, was, was warning them against, these false prophets. Now, if Jesus says that there will be false prophets, why would we say today that everybody who comes along is okay? That everybody who comes along gets a pass? The truth of the matter is we look at the fruit. We look at the things that are being manifested in their life. Now, tell me this. How do you examine fruit without making a judgment call? When we lived in, in Greenville, South Carolina, we would go to a, just a wonderful place during the fall. It was called Sky Top Orchard. It was this beautiful orchard that sat on the side of a, a hill and you'd get a little uh, basket and you'd go out there and you'd all kinds of different apples and you'd be able to pick whatever apples you wanted. But you know what you did? You inspected the apple. You didn't just grab any apple off the tree. You said, is it rotten? Does it have some wormholes? Is it not grown yet to maturity where it's going to be juicy and, and taste good? It still needs more time to, to ripen? You inspected the fruit. The same thing is true with those around us. At times we have to say, how is the fruit? And what is being produced? Let me give you an example of fruit. Go over to uh, 1 Corinthians. You're in Matthew. Turn forward in your Bible. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll give you a couple here of, of verses beginning in verse 3. They've got a problem in Corinth. They've got some sexual immorality in Corinth. And he says this, For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were pre present, him who has done this deed. Right? He's, he's living with his father's wife. Paul says, I've made a judgment. And how has he made that judgment? Because of the fruit. Because of how the man is, is living. And, and he goes on, staying there in chapter 5, he goes down to verse 7. He says, Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. You've got to cull things out. You've got to get rid of that leaven that's going to have a negative effect on that which is good. When I worked in, at HEB as a manager, you would go over to the produce and the, and, the, and the store manager would say, hey, Donald, go over and cull the oranges. What he meant was for me to go through and get rid of the bad, the bad oranges. 
Or listen, we, we've got some people who have complained about the cucumbers. Some of them are obviously bad. Go cull them. Go sort through them and get rid of the, the bad cucumbers. It's the same thing we're doing. We're culling out that bad leaven. That's a judgment call. We're looking to see what type of leaven is this individual. That's a judgment call. We're looking to say that when we examine the body of Christ, is there someone within that body that isn't benefiting the body, strengthening the body, helping the body, nurturing the body, loving the body, or are they that bad influence? Paul says you make a judgment call. Now, Paul specifies where this comes down to. If you go over to verse 9, he gives you some boundaries, and he says this, I wrote to you in my epistle um, not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet, I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or with extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world, where you're, you live in a sinful world. You've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been redeemed. You've been added to the Lord's church. You're in a good spot. But you still live in a world with, with sinners. You still live in a world that struggles. And so he, he says, you would, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Judgment call. Judgment call. This concept that since we're all sinners, we can't make a judgment. Well, that's not in the Bible. Here's a, a third thing. The, 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 the doctrine that is said one church is as good as another. And as appealing as that sounds, and it, I wouldn't deny that it's not appealing. Um, and there are, I don't know if they still have them anymore. They were big in the early 90s when the, evangel, 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 when the Pentecostal movement was really growing. And they had this unprecedented growth. And these bumper stickers showed up that said, join the church of your choice. They were, they were everywhere. You probably saw them. And so the concept is one church is good as another. But here's the truth. That's not in the Bible. The, the, the teaching that comes from man is it doesn't matter which church you attend because they're all good. Now... I understand the premise. Go to church. I, 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 I like that message. You need to be in church. You, you need to have a place where you, you worship God. The, 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 the push behind the sentiment is understandable. God wants you to worship. God wants you to serve. God wants you to come collectively as a body into his presence. Humble yourself and exalt him. I get it. I get it. But the idea that all churches are equal, well, that's not in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 16, in verse 18, you're in 1 Corinthians, turn backward. It has Jesus doing the speaking, and he is narrow. I'll just say it. He's narrow. And he says, speaking of something very specific, the church, he says these words. He says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, if you go back to, to, to 17 and 16, that, that rock is the confession that, that Peter made, not Peter himself, but who Jesus is. That confession, that rock, okay? He says, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Whose church is it? Christ's church. Who owns the church? Christ owns the church. Paul says in Ephesians 4, there's one body. There's one Christ. There's one head. There's one church. But look what's in the world. There's a multiplicity of churches. But one must come to a decision. One must step back and look and say, which one is in accordance with the word of God? Which one is right? We know that there can be one church 
because it says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 that God adds the saved. That's a specific group of people, friends, that God adds the saved to the church. So it's not true that all churches are okay. It doesn't matter where you go. It matters that you go to a church that is built upon who Jesus Christ is, that has Christ as his head, that follows the New Testament pattern for sound worship, to sing, pray, preach, teach, and give, partake of the Lord's Supper, that one holds to that pattern of New Testament doctrine and is faithful to it. It matters what church one goes to. Here's a fourth thing. This, this idea, this doctrine that says, uh, trust your heart to lead the way. Now, it might surprise you, but that's not in the Bible. Oh, I know the Bible talks about the heart. Don't get me wrong. I know the Bible talks about, you know, how we should love one another from the heart, you know, love one another deeply. I, I, I understand that. But as a guide, what the context is. As something, these emotions, the heart is the center of, of emotion. It's not talking about bum, 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 that, 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 that muscle that's in your chest. It's talking about your intellect. It's talking about your emotions. And the idea from the world is that your emotions can lead you into doing everything that's right. Man teaches your conscience. That voice that's talking to you right now. That voice when you have to make a decision to decide whether you're going to do it or not going to do it. That voice. That voice that says, here's what I think we should do today. That conscience. That voice that says whether or not it's right or wrong. That conscience. That conscience is moved by emotions, by, by ways that you feel. I felt it was right in my heart. I felt like I was doing the right thing. It felt good to me. But that doesn't mean it was right. That doesn't mean it was good and godly. The Bible teaches that the heart can be deceptive. Go back to your Old Testament. Go back to the book of Proverbs, almost right there in the middle of, of your, your Old Testament. You'll run into it. In Proverbs 14 and verse 12, it says these words, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. How many people have I sat across in my office that have said to me, but I sure thought it was the right way. What led you? Well, felt right in my heart. It's the word of God. John 17, 17, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. It is the word of God that ought to direct our conscience. That ought to lead us into making a decision of what's right or wrong. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. It's the word of God. It's scripture that helps us to know and understand whether something we are about to do is good or godly. You know why? Because your conscience can be corrupted. Your heart can be wrong. And in the end, because you followed that which felt right instead of that which is taught to be right, you hurt. You got pain in your life. You're sad. You got fractured relationships. You feel distant from God. I, I understand that people say, follow your heart to lead the way, but that's not in the Bible. Let me give you one more. The, the doctrine that says baptism is not essential to salvation. That, that is a... One of the most popular doctrines today. And it is probably the one definitive doctrine that separates the church of Christ from so many different denominations that are in the world today. This, this concept that they're not denying that baptism is taught in the scriptures. Don't think that. They see the word baptism. They see that people are back. They, they understand that. The concept is, in order for you to be in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, their doctrine is, you don't need to be immersed in water. And so man teaches that you can be saved apart from baptism. But the Bible teaches that it's essential to salvation. Let me give you some examples. Go over to, to 1 Peter. You're in Proverbs. You've got to turn all the way back to your New Testament, turning towards the end of it, you'll run into 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. And it says, 
There is also an anti-type. You have type and anti-types in the Bible. Okay? There is also an anti-type which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's not saying when you take a bath, you're saved. He's not saying when you take a bath, that's same as being baptized. He's not saying when you jump in the swimming pool to swim around when it's 108 degrees outside that you're being baptized. There's a purpose, there's a focus, there's a meaning, and there's a reason behind New Testament baptism. It's not ignorant. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why I did it. I don't know what it means. Those conditions have to be met in order for somebody to be scripturally baptized. You see it in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 on the day of Pentecost after Peter preaches. And they say, what do we need to do? He says, you need to repent and you need to be baptized. Why? Because remember in Acts 2 and verse 47, it's the saved that are being added to the church. The saved are those who are baptized in Acts chapter 2. How can one say they're saved? Apart from baptism. Apart from baptism, one is in their sin. Acts 22 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul, in talking about his conversion, says that he was told by Ananias to arise and be baptized, washing away your sin. Now, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that fulfills that. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that that makes us whole. You don't get baptized. There's a baptistry behind me. It's not filled with blood. It's filled with plain old tap water with a little bit of bleach or chlorine or whatever we spick and span. I don't know what we put in there. It's water. But it's the understanding of what is represented by that moment of baptism. It's the understanding that that moment of baptism, not as Peter says, washes away the filth of the flesh. It's what Paul says. It's spiritual in nature. It washes away sin. Listen, when you come up from being baptized, you look the same, you weigh the same. There's no difference in how your outward appearance is. It's all spiritual. And that's the way God has designed it. So this idea of if one wants to be saved, that they can be saved apart from baptism, is certainly not anything that's taught in Acts chapter 2. This idea, this doctrine that one can be saved apart from baptism surely isn't being talked about in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 when Jesus says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. What don't they believe? They don't believe in Christ. They don't believe in what they're supposed to do. They surely don't believe in the need to be baptized. But you see one example after another of people being baptized for the remission of their sins. You don't need to be baptized in order to be saved. Come on. That's not in the Bible. What, what do we do, friends? Well, I put this down at the conclusion of, 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 of the outline. I say our goal, and that's what we're setting here. The, the end purpose, there, there's got to be a reason that we don't want to follow doctrines that aren't in the Bible, right? There's got to be a, a point behind it. And, and so I say our goal is to be a people that only teach book, chapter, and verse. We need to be able to support the things that we believe with a book, with a chapter, and a verse. We need to be able to say to individuals when they ask us a question, here's what it says in the Bible, and, and this is where you find it in the Bible. We have to be a people of reason and intellect and understanding who can rightly divide the Word of God. Who can say this is the understanding and the implications behind it? This is what the meaning of the passage is. This is what God would have us know and understanding. And that comes from more and more and more study of the Word of God. You'll never be able to answer the question. Never, never be able to answer the question, is that in the Bible, if you don't know what's in the Bible in the first place? Do you know what's in the Bible? I hope so. 
Let me extend to you the invitation this morning. If you're here and we can do something to help you or encourage you, if you're here and you'd like us to pray with you and for you, well, listen, we're a praying church. We would love to do that. If you have a need or a situation that you need to visit with and talk about, we stand ready to do that. I'll visit with you in the in, 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 in my office, or visit in, 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 in the pew. We could visit in the parking lot, ah, anywhere. I'm happy to visit with you. If you're here this morning and you are not a Christian, probably the most important thing that I would have you take away from this message is the understanding that you need to be right with God because that's in the Bible. And if you haven't obeyed the gospel plan of salvation to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized, would you consider that this morning? Would you consider having your sins washed away and being added to the church by God himself? I hope so. Listen, if you're subject to the invitation, won't you come forward as we stand and sing? There's a fountain of creatures for you and me. That will take so haste to its brink. Tis the fount of love from the source above. And he bids us all freely drink. Will you call to the fountain free? Will you call? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a rock that's cleft, and no soul is left that may not its pure water share. Tis for you and me, and its stream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you, Father, for those that are present. Father, we pray that the lesson that has been presented this day will be an, an encouragement and an enlightenment to all. Father, as we assemble this day, it's with joyful heart that we can stand before you, we can come to you as our Father through your Son and ask and know that we can receive the blessings that come only through you. We ask that you be with those of our congregation that are upon the bed of affliction, those that are having tests, those that or having procedures. Father, bless them and their family. Be with all of the young men and women, wherever they may be this day. Give them the opportunity to hear your word. And Father, we pray that they can return home to their family. We pray for the young widows and the orphans and all those that walk the streets and the hospitals, wherever they are. Father, just be with them and bless them. Be with us as we depart this building. 
May we have the opportunity to return and hear your word once again. In Christ's holy name.